What's up, everyone? This week on the pod, we are talking hardcore. You know what's up. First off, Anthony Papalardo steps up against the champ, Dan Sant. It's a rematch of trivia, of epic proportions. Will anyone get a 25 to life lyric correct? Stay tuned for that. Then we're going to break down a pretty deep question, actually. And that's, uh, why did hardcore never get mainstream? Or did it? Or what's the closest ever got? I think it's a really cool conversation. So check that out. Then Anthony Papalardo is going to lay out a Boston hardcore starter kit. We're digging into all that early Boston hardcore stuff. It's super cool. I think you're going to like it. Then we're going to break down a couple newer-ish punk or hardcore records. So I think you're going to enjoy the episode. I think it's one of the best we've done. So let me know what you think. Please support the podcast by subscribing to it wherever you listen to it. Also, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, if you could rate it and review it, that is awesome. Respect all the people that have already done it. It is much appreciated. Also, if you go to the website, 185milesouth.com, there is a playlist for every episode. Click that playlist link, and you can check out the music that we talk about on the pod, because that's what it's all about. It's about the music, dude, you know? Also, I put up a link for all the people that have done vocal test karaoke so far. So you can listen to all those on the website. There's a link for that as well. And most importantly, while you're on the website, smash that Patreon button. The Patreons are the people that keep this podcast alive. This podcast would not exist without them. And I love them to a person. Lastly, a shout out to my main man, Roger Camaro. Happy birthday, brother. And uh, yeah, let's get on with the pod. One hundred and eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. Introducing first, the challenger, fighting out of the hard corner, from Brooklyn, New York. He's got nothing to hide and a title to gain. It's Anthony, poppin' many suckers, Papa Lardo. And his opponent, fighting out of the core corner, from parts unknown, weight unknown. Reason he didn't pick minor threat in the straight edge Super 7, unknown. It is the reigning, defending, undisputed 185 miles south trivia champion of the world, Daniel. These questions are too easy. Sant! All right, and we're going to send the first question to Anthony Papalardo. Now, Pops, which alternative rock band released the albums Repeater and In on the Kill Taker? Um, I don't know how y- y'all pr- pronounce this one. I call it Fug- Fugazi, but I guess <laughs> Fugazi would be acceptable too. We'll take Fugazi or we'll take uh, Fugazi, the Donnie yeah. Brasco way. Yeah, yeah, Fugazi. That's a colloquial term in New York. Yeah, right on. Okay, one point to Pops. And we go to Dan for your first question. Dan, this Rhode Island band put out records titled Trial on an Exit. Verbal assault. A point to the champ. All right, going back to Pops. Round two. Pops, according to the agnostic front song, The Eliminator, what is the singer's business, and how is it doing? <laughs> um, dude, a little out of my wheelhouse, but I'd say killing. <laughs> I'm going to guess killing and uh, well. <laughs> but we go to Ben. Or good. We go to Ben. Ben, what do you think, ref? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to fact check this for a second here. It's, he might, he might have uh, nailed this one. <laughs> no, we're going to, we're going to have to go to the champ to see if he can, he can steal this point. We go no, to Dan for the possible steal. He, he said it like he said good right after. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to 
I'm going to say he got that. Well, Dan, you're not the ref, so no points this round. The answer is <laughs> killing is his business, and business is fine. Uh, all right. A synonym? We're going to get off on a synonym? Okay. Well, I know, I know. That's why I shot it to the ref. I wasn't going to try to be the bad guy, but he, it always turns out I have to be the dick. God damn you know it. What's interesting is I thought the lyric was good. I did, too. <laughs> That's why I had to look it up just now. I thought it was good as well. <laughs> Killing right, his well, mom business and business is fine. It's not good. It's just my okay. business and business is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, business is decent, dude. You know, it's not great. It's not terrible. Yeah. You know, I, I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see. I I missed a couple times. Like I, I tried to kill four people, only hit two. <laughs> business is fine. You know. All right, we go to Dan for his round two. Dan, true or false? No effects put out in. Oh, no effects put out a record on Epitaph in the 1980s. Um, I'm going to say that's true. 1989, I think. A point to the champ. He's the champ for a reason. S&M Airlines comes out 1989 Epitaph Records. Yeah, featuring the, the, the uh, Fleetwood Mac cover with Bad Religion singing on it as well. How about that? Fun facts. All right, Pops, we go to you. Round number three, true or false? Both mouthpiece seven inches have four songs. Um, I'm going to go true on that. A point to Pops. We got a game, people. All right, Dan, we go to you for your round number three. Dan, the original version of Seven Seconds, Walk Together, Rock Together, was drawn by this artist that also drew the Nardcore comp and played drums for Scared Straight. Um. Oh my god! Oh, so wasn't the original version the Pusshead art though? Nope. No, that's okay. a hint. That's a hint. It's a friendly hint. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, played drums for Scared Straight, not uh. Walsby. A point to the champ. He worked mm. it out. Ben, what was that question from way back when Dan had to like grind his brain and work it out after 10 seconds? That was like the most amazing thing I ever heard. I wish I could remember what that was, but yeah, it took him a really long time and he got the answer right. So it was like, oh, no. wow, brain power. It comes in <laughs> handy sometimes. It is the champ's brain. We can't remember because our brains are not as big as Dan's. See, okay. I, there was something like, there's something sticking in my head that makes me think that the Pusshead one was first, which it obviously isn't now. Because there was the purple one and then the yellow one, right? For the for the art, but um, but it's the same art, just a different color. Yeah, and I think I think it's mainly just because my mind is blown that Pusshead did that other cover when it looks so on Pusshead. Mm -hmm. But that's cool. It's a cool thing that Pusshead did. Like he did like a new wave cover. Yeah, yeah. My kind friend, of... who's a graphic designer, said, "What a great record!" and what two big whiffs um the, the original cover is the least enthusiastic crowd ever and the second one is just what <laughs> so. i love yeah. that original one though the crowd on the original one is rivaling the uh judge bringing it down crowd <laughs> so but yeah everyone check out the archives uh the brian walsby interview he gets into why the cover changes and we go to pops for round number four pops this lp compilation came out in 1990 on Conversion Records and featured Integrity, Outspoken, and Amenity. Oh, um... Is that... Fuck. Oh, shit. Voice of the fucking thousands or some shit? A point to pops. <laughs> Noble Challenger. Look at this. I knew you were going to get that. I knew it. I wouldn't serve it up if I didn't think you could get it. All right, Dan, that's here we go. Si that's some radio silence, deep knowledge shit right there. <laughs> Dude, that's right in the wheelhouse. All right, Dan, we go to you for your question four. A co another AF lyric question. What's up? Okay. okay. <laughs> you can tell I write these in chunks. Uh, Dan, according to the that's Agnostic right. Front song. What? You said chunks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there this episode. <laughs> Never mind. <I'm> just... <laughs> Dan, okay, according to the Agnostic Front song, Remind Them, what do we need to remind them? A, they taught us to lie. B, they've corrupted our lives. C, 
both A and B, or D, none of the above. Can you repeat the question? There's a, too much going on here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Gnostic Front song, Remind Them, what do we need to remind them? Is it A, they taught us to lie? Is it B, they've corrupted our lives? Is it C, both A and B? Or is it D, none of the above? Oh, okay. It's C. Point to the champ. All right. Um, okay. We got a pops for round number five. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Spit it out, Dan. Come on. It just was so funny that you. It, well, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> this, dude, I know. These are hard. I got to like fall back on something instead of going, uh. Oh, okay. my line. That's your line and um and like. Okay. Pops, what famous photographer took the cover shot of the aggression LP? Don't be mistaken. I have no clue. I'm gonna I'll just throw a guess out there, Ed Culver. We go to Dan for the possible steal. Dan, what famous photographer Oh no, I know who that is. Fucking A. All right, shit. Anyway. I thought you'd know. I, I know that know. that's a big hint, Dan. <laughs> I forgot, what, I forgot what the photo was. Now I remember. Damn it. Well, my, my guess would be Glennie Friedman. Correct. A, a steal from the champ. The champ for a reason, people. Okay, Dan, you're round number five. A UK hardcore band. And also what Jake Roberts had when Ravishing Rick Rude revealed Jake's wife airbrushed on his tights at SummerSlam 1988. A UK hardcore band, and what? Um, well, it, <laughs> I was going to say a, a silly joke. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Jake had some discharge. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Final answer, Dan? Um... Blind Rage. We go to Pops for the possible steal. Can you repeat repeat that insane question? Yeah. Of course. A UK hardcore band, and also what Jake Roberts had when Ravishing Rick Rude revealed Jake's wife airbrushed on his tights at SummerSlam 1988. I have no chaos, dude. I have no clue. (laughs) A violent reaction. Oh, yeah. Of of course. (laughs) Yes, of course. (laughs) Dan, I served it right up for you, man. You did, but I preferred the discharge answer. <laughs> yeah, you I had to say it. you had to say that. Yeah, that was that's true. That's true. Okay, we go to pops for round number six. Is the X'd up hand on the smorgasbord logo on the left hand or the right hand? Ooh, um, I'm gonna go with memory, and I'm gonna say right. We go to Dan for the potential steal. Oof. Oh, Dan. Dan, Dan, can you get this one? <laughs> it's not on the middle hand. <laughs> Dan, I'll repeat the question for you. Is the X'd up hand on the smorgasbord logo on the left hand or the right hand? Well, as Southpaw Instagrammer, I'm going to say the left Oof. hand. A point to the champ. All right. Dan, we go to you for uh, another, oh, another Connecticut-related <laughs> question. How about that? Dan, on the cover of... All right. What's up, Reggie? What's going on, bud? Okay, Dan, on the cover of the follow-through LP, Taking It Back, the singer is depicted jumping. Is he wearing socks? <laughs> I'm going to say... What, what? Can you repeat the question? On the cover of the follow-through LP, Taking It Back... The singer is depict- depicted jumping. Is he wearing socks? Now, I've got to just guess if it is... Reggie, shut up. I've got to guess if it is in the summer or the, or not, because it's 90s, so there's a lot of people wearing, like, Jack Purcells and uh, Chuck Taylors with no socks around those, those times. But... Um... God, I don't know. It's Connecticut, right? So 
It's cold. Yes, he's wearing socks. Point to the champ. He doesn't miss, fellas. What's up? <laughs> Holy fuck. That's the craziest question. <laughs> Come on, man. It's just a yes or no. It's a coin flip. All right. Yeah, and you see how much thought I put into it? Wow, that was great. That's why you're the champ. You worked it out and got it right. What's up? Okay, Ben, let's go to you for the subtotals. All right. So we have uh, Dan with seven points and Pops with three points. And so you can each wager going into this final round. And well, Let me hit the music, Dan. Let me hit the music. Here we go. Back by popular demand. <laughs> Okay. All right, Ben, you can explain the rules now. <laughs> we're, we're doing this a little differently than the last time. We're going to have both of you wager before the first question is asked. That's right. So this is a daily double round. You can put up all your points. Dan, you have seven points. Pops, you got three. And yeah, Dan, how much are you going to wager? One point, Alex. All right, Dan is going to wager one point, And Pops... How many points do you want to wager on this 25 to life song being able to guess the lyrics? I'm going to fucking go all in, dude. Pops wagering three. All yeah, right, here we what go. What do I have to lose? I'm going against the champ, dude. I'm playing with house money over here. YOLO. <laughs> Let's do this. Here you go, Pops. <laughs> Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> We we can play it as many times as you want. Let's go one more time. Is the question, does this suck shit? The answer is yes. I don't even know, dude. Well, it's actually a pretty good song. I enjoy this one. Yeah, dude. I've, I guess I just lost all of three points. So there we go. I'm not going to take a swing at it. What all kind right. of fucking madness is this? You can play it one more time. Just for, I'll, I'll guess. Okay, I'll try to go. I'll try to decipher uh to li- to ease. Let's go. Here we go. Um fucking <laughs> <laughs> take a breast, eat a eat the rest. I don't know, dude. I don't know what the fuck that fool said. I think he, he said something about take a breath. No, he says let the past be the past. Oh, obviously. Yeah, of course. All right, everyone. We're <laughs> We're going to play it again. Sing along. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, yeah. All it's right, right Dan. There. Dan, we go to you, even though uh, you have one. But uh, <laughs> let's just do it for fun because fuck it. All right, here we go. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you a hint. It's the answer to the last time you did this. Remember, you're like, oh, what is uh, what is this leading to? And I was like, I couldn't tell you. This is the second half of that chorus. Okay. Play it again. Here we go. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at the answer, and there's no way he could be saying those words. There's just no way. I didn't know the the final Jeopardy was fucking foreign languages for a thousand, dude. What the fuck. <laughs> Had I known the topic, I would have wagered nothing. Jesus. <laughs> can you play it one more time? <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Here we go. Ooh, I have a guess. I have a guess on that, but Dan, come on. We fell victim to your lies once before. Won't do it. We fell victim to your lies no more. We fell victim to your lies once before. The low down. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a different song. I tricked you. You did. Uh, That's what I was trying to. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, this one was. It was. This is. He says, wise. To the game. To the game. All right. Yeah, man. That All was right, the answer. I thought it was respect this dick. That's what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> Play it one more time with that in go. mind. Here we go. 
Thank you. <laughs> he's not <laughs> saying wise to the game. There's no way he's, he's saying that. He's not saying wise to the game. He's definitely mm-hmm. saying wise to the game. Ben, he's let's go definitely to you. saying respect this dick, dude. Come on. <laughs> I don't know, man. Okay, Ben, let's go to you for the uh, the totals. Uh, Pops wagered all of his points and didn't get the answer right. And so he's left with donuts and the returning champion, uh, Daniel Sant, uh, wagered one point of his seven, didn't get the answer right because no one to date has gotten one of these right. Nobody. So he's left with six points. Dan remains the reigning champion. All right. Congratulations, Dan. 25 to life. For for better or for worse, <laughs> or just bet zero every time. You're the champ. You gotta know. You gotta know the ropes, man. All right. Well, I, I I bet one because even if he got it right and I got it wrong, we would tie. Way to go, dude. What's up, everyone? This week on the pod, we are talking hardcore. Helping out, you know him, you love him. He is the best dressed man on the pod. He is Daniel Sant. What's up, Dan? Hello, hello, hello. Also helping out, it is Ben Merlis, a.k.a. Ben Edge, a.k.a. Bedge. What's going on, Ben? What's going on? Yeah. And helping out, the man that needs no introduction. It is Anthony Papalardo, a.k.a. Pops. What's up, Pops? What's up, world? Yeah, man. So yeah, the question <laughs> the question <laughs> I wanted to present today, god damn it, dude. Already? <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, the question I wanted to present today, I'd actually heard before on, uh, either the, this is hardcore podcast or the post America podcast. It was Joe hardcore talking with Richie and they were, they were waxing poetic on why hardcore never went mainstream. And I thought it was like a really interesting question. And I wanted to talk about it with you guys. So Dan, do you have a take on why hardcore never went mainstream? And also like, what do you think is the closest it got? It's a really interesting uh, question. I'm going to say it never went mainstream because there's an intangible about hardcore that you, it's, it's rubbing against the mainstream. It's not being mainstream. So to fully be embraced by the mainstream, it would have to be completely watered down and a really poor representation of it. So therefore it just, can never be mainstream. Now, that being said, there are things that have popped up on the cusp, you know, and, um, but I always find the point that those moments happen where, let's say, um, Step Down by Sick of It All is played on 120 minutes and, and Headbangers Ball, or, um, say like the shape of punk to come starts getting all this uh critical buzz these are things that are representative that are coming from the hardcore world but they're not really representing well, step down doesn't represent the majority of sick of it all sound for the most part right it's their poppy song it's their it's their really sing along catchy uh song so And then the shape of punk to come is pushing the boundary and incorporating like some techno in there, some, you know, really attempting to play with the format of hardcore to take it in another direction, which is not bringing full on hardcore with it. So it can never be fully grasped in my opinion, because I mean, a, a few uh, weeks ago, we discussed in that question time part has straight edge ruined hardcore, and the you know we all had our answers. But while I was going through it, it was like there's something, and I'm just referencing that because there was something I I said then that I think speaks really true to this. There's something innate about hardcore that is this. You know, we always say the uns, you know, the unspoken uh, words, or like the, you know, the hidden handshake, or the, you know, the nod that people just get it. But unless you've been around it, it it's an it's an 
unattainable thing. You have to participate to understand and it can't just be served up to a mainstream audience that just consumes. So yeah, that's I, oh, no, go ahead. Well, I just, I think that, you know, for something to be mainstream, there has to be like a little bit of common consensus, right? Like if you read the history of rock and roll, right, there's 50 books out, like uh, there's probably hundreds of books, right? Well, let's say that you chose 50 books on the history of rock and roll. It's not going to like diverge too much. Like there's a little bit of a common consensus. And I think that like, you know, just from doing this podcast and talking about the history of punk and hardcore, like a lot of people have different opinions of, you know, what's the start of punk? What's the start of hardcore? Is there a middle ground? Like what are the most classic albums? And I think the fact that there is no common consensus is a thing that it makes it like a, a genre that's really hard to get the history down. Like how does someone get into this? Like there's no like, here's the 10 albums you need to know to get started. You know what I mean? Like, cause there is no consensus on that. It's always going to be wild. What do you think about this pops? I thought about this like quite a bit this week. And um, so I've, I've two things to bring up. So the first one is kind of a, it's more of a big idea thing. If you zoom out. So if we, if this podcast was about free jazz, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't be like, why is free jazz not popular? Because, or mainstream because you'd be like it's really grating and it's like a little heady and you have to really be into the culture of free jazz to understand it right you can apply that to kind of like a lot of different genres of music um and you you know that they aren't fighting to they're they're not posing this question so then then i was like thinking about hardcore and i'm like hardcore is this very strange dichotomy because it's about grassroots, but it's also still essentially rock music. But but at the heart of it, right, if your band doesn't get a reaction from the crowd, it feels like a failure. So you're constantly building off this, this feeling of acceptance. And so therefore, there's always going to be this carrot in front of hardcore that it, it as much as it's kind of like a cat, like it wants you to pet it until you pet it. You know, like hardcore wants it until they get it. And then it's like, oh, wait, that's a problem. Um, so that's like one factor. The other factor is I think hardcore is mainstream, right? There's movies made about it. It's questions on Jeopardy. It's in the cultural lexicon. It gets referenced from uh, fashion. There's, you know, if you look at, if you pick like certain rock bands, they have some tied, you know, they all have like a, six degrees of Kevin Bacon to hardcore. And if I was thinking about like this one, there was a bunch of moments in the nineties. So you could pick like, uh, you could say when biohazard got big, right. That was probably the biggest hardcore band at the time. And then Evans on Oz, right. That's a possibility. But, but I was really isolating if there was a moment, right. A cultural moment, say we're like 94, 95 around there there's really only one band that's recorded a hardcore song that went platinum officially. And that would be the beastie boys. The whole record wasn't, but you have check your head 92 ill communication on 94. They both have hardcore songs on them. They're touring around, they're covering minor threat. They do the hardcore EP, uh, Aglio Yolio, right? They bring DFL on tour, 95 sieves popping rancid is popping, right? If there was anything that like sounds, if we had a consensus of like what sounds hardcore, it is those really rudimentary songs. And it didn't catch on because I just don't think that's a format that people can relate to because it is too grating. So I think hardcore never went mainstream because it's not supposed to. It's just not a sound, you know, it doesn't have, it has verses and choruses to us, but to a civilian, they're never going to work. And so in its purest form, even the bad brains, they're not going to be, they're not going to be accepted. And especially now where uh, kind of like what's accepted music has to be so slick and produced and, and like it has to sound right out of laptop speakers and phone speakers. That's not how you experience hardcore. So I, I think it's, it's two things. It is mainstream and also it doesn't need to be mainstream, but it but it it always has this strange chip on its shoulder. So that's that's my convoluted take. No, I think that was great, Ben. What's your take on this? I'm gonna um, 
agree with Pop Sandan in that it never went mainstream because it's too niche of a genre. Like it's very attributes repel normal people from it. You got, you know, most, you know, norms on the street don't want to hear fast, brutal music with shouted or screamed vocals with little to no melody. And the further away a hardcore band gets from having those attributes, the better their chances of mainstream appeal are. But also the less hardcore the music sounds. So you have like watered down hardcore mixed with pop punk, all a you know, 2000s era victory records bands. And then you have that alt rock, what some people call hardcore adjacent style, which would be like quicksand or even like a band, a newer band like turn style. And then you have like straight up metal bands who just self identify as hardcore, like later corrosion of conformity or later suicidal. Actually, I don't even know if later suicidal identifies with hardcore, but anyway, you have like bands that don't play hardcore and they can call themselves hardcore all day and they can get huge, but they're just not playing that, that style of music. And, um, you know, there'd be the chance of crossing over with wider audiences doing that kind of stuff. But we, and when I say we, I mean, the four of us know that that isn't pure hardcore music when they're doing that. So you have like the moments that where hardcore brushes with the mainstream, you have like fear playing Saturday night live in 1981. And that, that was strictly a favor to John Belushi because he was the guest host uh, on that episode. This is after he left SNL and he was already a movie star. And so he comes back to guest host it and he goes, I want this band no one's ever heard of and doesn't even have an album out called Fear to be the, be the uh, g- uh, guest band. And, you know, they just f- say, okay, fine, John Belushi. And then, it, you know, chaos ensues and every all the shit gets broken or whatever. And people like, basically, they're not booking more hardcore on Saturday Night Live. And that's not even the reason Fear was on there. It was just a favor to a guy. And then you have like a few years later, institutionalized by suicidal tendencies, um, gets play on MTV and they even make an appearance on an episode of Miami Vice. And if you listen to the Lisa Fancher episode on 185 miles South, she, I, she talks about that. And that was kind of a fiasco and they completely missed the mark. Like it looks like a dance club and people are just doing like eighties dancing to like suicidal tendencies playing institutionalized it makes no sense and then you have it flash forward to the 90s you have like civ they have, they have that can't want, wait one minute more video on mtv where it looks like a fake talk show and like half that album was like that style of popular punk and half was gorilla biscuit style hardcore so i mean can't wait one minute more is more of that pop punk thing so it was like a great way to like trick norms into buying a CD that has, you know, eight hardcore songs on it. But that, I don't think that was their intention. And I don't know if it turned more people onto hardcore, it definitely didn't make hardcore a mainstream thing. And then you have like a few more things. I'm going to rattle these off really fast. Blink-182, the drummer has Can I Say tattooed across his chest. And that does not inspire anybody, uh, you know, blink bro punk Blink-182 fans to like discover Dag Nasty. Jamie Josta from Hate Breed ho- becomes the host of Headbangers Ball, but that actually makes sense because like Thugged Out Connecticut Mosh has way more in common with Sepultura than Minor Threat anyway. And then you have here's my last one: the Misfits do an arena tour in like 2018, 2019, and their sets include some of that Earth AD material. So you have like 20,000 people watching full on hardcore music in an arena, or a, in my case, a soccer stadium. But that's not really why they're there. You know, they're there because they have all those classics songs they had already written before they put out their their sole weird attempt at hardcore in 1983. So, like, these are just like things like hardcore never gets mainstream. It's just there's just these little weird blips like an- they're all anomalies. Yeah, Ben, you bring up uh, two things that I think are, are pretty crucial to my argument. One is, you know, talking about when it gets close, it's always like the the hardcore adjacent or someone mixing in pop punk or playing metal. So that goes back to that there's like there's no real common consensus of what hardcore sounds like, you know. And so how can something be mainstream when there's no common consensus of even what it is? 
because I talk about like, you know, by 1986, hardcore bands are not playing like traditional hardcore music necessarily anymore. And if you, but like, you could never accuse agnostic front of not being a hardcore band. Like they might be the hardcore band, right? Like, so, so at some point it diverges and it becomes like this, this thing where we talk about like the secret handshake and shit. It's just either hardcore or it's not. And you know, there are purists that like can argue about like the sonic, like the way things sound, you know, but that's not necessarily what hardcore is. The other thing, Ben, that you bring up is that fear appearance on Saturday Night Live. And thanks for serving that up because this goes to common consensus a lot. Like that is like everyone, like a lot of the main players in hardcore 1981 or what would be like the main players in the next few years, like they're all in on fear. So it's like, they can, they can come to a common consensus that like, okay, here's a band fear. Everyone loves them. You know, like think about the crowd. You have the New York hardcore dudes. You have dudes coming from Detroit. You have dudes coming from DC. Everyone's there. Everyone loves fear. I don't know if there's a single band like that now, because like you could have like hardcore dudes that like, don't even like minor threat. Right. Or like, Hardcore dudes that don't like, you know, Agnostic Front or hardcore dudes that don't like cro whatever. Like, there is no common consensus band where back then at least everyone liked Fear. Like, there was a there was a band that everyone's like, this band rips. What do you guys think about that? Well, did they like Fear or did they like being on TV? I think that's like a little tenuous. So, but I, I kind of agree, but but I also feel like the band becomes less important when there's when it gets elevated, it's like, do you want to be on Saturday night live and your gateway in this fear? You might be the biggest fear fan that night, you know? Um, but, but something I want to touch on that Ben pointed out was this idea of the misfits playing arenas. Right. I think one of the reasons why hardcore could never go mainstream is that it doesn't translate into arenas well at all. Um, and so even the misfits like playing that earth ad material it's the way the way hardcore works it's so much better in a small room where the person in the back can get to the front very easily if you're playing to 5000 8000 people and you're you pick agnostic front the chromags whomever right the most professional bands they don't translate into that room you don't have the same experience as seeing them at cbgb and i think that's always a barrier like um Dave Gahan from Depeche Mode would always talk about when the band started getting bigger, he realized he needed to translate to the last person in the room. And he would study like the way you speak publicly, the way your, your body moves, right? Like very heady, heady ways to fill that space. And hardcore shouldn't think about that because that's not what it is, you know? So I just, I just think the whole the whole way you engage with it is just not made for mainstream. <laughs> you know? Right. Or like, or like agnostic front, right. They're a, a professional band that like when they do Europe or they do big rooms, it's like the biggest song has got to go. It's not victim in pain. Right. right? It, it is a song for a big room or for a festival. Or like when you listen to like a lot of later sick of it all albums, like that aren't the first couple, like they're writing songs for big rooms or festivals. Right. It makes sense in that context when you're listening to it. It's like, oh, I, I could f- like I can see this is like where people bounce or whatever, but it's not necessarily like them playing Blood, Sweat, No Tears. Damn. Yeah, because when, when you're a diehard sorry to interrupt, when you're a diehard fan, you're 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 kind of there for your lyric, like whatever that is. You're like, Oh, I can't wait to climb to the front of the stage and maybe I'll get the mic for this whatever lyric that means something to me. And if you're a casual fan, you just want to put your fist up and yell, gotta 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 go in the same way that you might yell fucking bow to leper messiah or whatever, you know, it's like, it's not as intimate. Right. Right. Dan, jump in here. Well, I think I'm going to say on two things, first and foremost, I'm just going to continue the point that hardcore is bigger than what the music is. Hardcore is the DIY ethic. Hardcore is the being jumped on. Uh, you know, with raw energy and singing along and grabbing the mic and being a part of something, it it could never be mainstream. Like you see all the push moshers and the, you know, people when they think they know what's up with hardcore, but they don't have a fucking clue. It 
it's so easy to spot someone getting it wrong that's why hardcore is that you know shared knowledge and it is like a social it's a social system like you you don't know everything about hardcore when you start going to shows but it's a, it's a learned procedure like it's actual social knowledge you know um but the thing i was going to say in regards to what uh pop said about it being in the mainstream i feel lots of the times that hardcore is referenced in the mainstream like whether it be a uh, chris novoselic wearing an ssd shirt or it's uh you know dave grohl being in every fucking documentary about hardcore ever um these are them showing off like look dudes i've got cred you know it, it's not even like it's seeping in because it's power of that it's people trying to show it off as and 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 some of it with total love you know like say what you want i really don't care for the Foo fires at all but that that um series they did where they went to different cities and recorded awful songs the build-up parts of those episodes were really cool though like you know where they would actually talk about hardcore history and stuff in places but it was only simply so they could be a give something back to something they loved, but also show it off. Like we know what's up, you know? So yeah, then you, the, yeah. But then you also have like Josh Brolin or Justin Thoreau where like, are, are they showing off or they just were into hardcore? You know, it goes, I think it's both. Yeah. I think it's completely both. Yeah, and you have the kook. Who's the kook who covered up his soul side tattoo? Zach, whatever. Uh, Nelson? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that guy. <laughs> well, that dude's a poser, we know, but you're talking about another Zach. <laughs> yeah, I forget, but he had a soul side tattoo and it's covered up. He's married to some other actress. Forgetting the dude's name right now, but that was uh, oh, that's some trivia. <laughs> the documentary thing like cuts both ways right like because the documentary people are having dave Grohl on for the name value when they could get someone you know who's maybe more dialed in also is oh, yeah. most of the documentaries are, are relatively disappointing although we appreciate the effort everyone keep making them but zach, uh, zach back to your point about like no there was no consensus on what hardcore is but let, let's just for the sake of argument um paint with the broadest brush possible like everything possibly you can think of that could be hardcore is hardcore in this universe we've created here hardcore still hasn't gone mainstream like what's the what's the closest it's gotten is it biohazard you know right suicidal or biohazard yeah i think those are those are really good points of where it where it is you know when you start seeing those bands like in a Kerrang or in a um, a Spin or a Rolling Stone, where and then also on TV and and uh, I would say institutionalized was like pretty alternative radio playing it like a decent amount probably at the time, right? Back to the consensus thing though, like let, let's do it as an exercise, not to put you guys on the spot too much, so. You can, if you don't feel comfortable, just tell me and we'll blow this part up. But, uh, like, if you had to say, like, give someone three hardcore records to say what hardcore is, like, what would you guys choose, Dan? Like, off the top of your head. Off the top of my head, I would say Bad Brains Raw, Minor Threat 2, 7 inches on an LP, and Agnostic Front Victim in Pain. I think that's pretty good. Pops, what do you think? Dang, um, those are great choices. Um, I would say to not overlap, say negative approach, seven inch, um, circle jerk, circle jerks, group sex, and then to cast it out a little wider, I'd say New York City hardcore the way it is. But we're looking for overlap. So would you duplicate any of Daniels? Yeah, I'd bat Rourke said all day. <laughs> yeah. Right on. So, so we have like one consensus on on Roar. Ben, where are you yeah, going? But then they're also like the insane outlier too. So it's kind of funny. Right, my, Ben, my, where are you going on this? 
my answer before Dan even answered is almost identical, which is bad brains, roar, um, minor threat, kind of anything before salad days. But yeah, first two seven inches on one LP, sure. And then um, uh, black flag damaged. Yeah, I think I just, I dupe Dan. So we do have a little consensus here. No germs on that. Damn. It's 1.5, man. There you go, baby. Oh, what am I? I forgot. Yeah. I, lost up. I walked Shout right in. Edge. I walked right into that. Damn it. Yeah. Shout out, Edge. All right. Anything you guys want to wrap on on this before we get out of here, Dan? I would say if I had to synthesize it down to one LP completely, I would have to say even even though the other stuff's probably more poignant and more like the birth of it, but Victim in Pain, I think, encompasses – just what that just the untangible of what hardcore is yeah i i'm gonna back you so we got consensus dan on that i think that's that's a good one to single out it feels like so dirty not saying minor threat but the af like it does encompass everything of like the first like wave of hardcore i think it adds the hard like in in the in the kind of the fact that there's truly no bullshit do you know what I mean? For sure. Pops, final take. Um, I only have one observation is that I'm going to go back to the Beastie Boys for ill communication and check your head because they kind of did a reverse sieve. Um, they had <laughs> these like rap songs or whatever, or hybrid songs, and then they buried the hardcore songs on there. And it's still, you know, those are still the only hardcore songs documented to sell multi platinum, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Like if, if, if that was going to jump off and I think those songs are, if we're talking consensus, like heart attack, man's a hardcore song. Right. And Definitely. it didn't work. <laughs> Time for living is. Yeah. Ta- yeah. Frontline yeah. song. So. And also to add to your point pops, they played heart attack man on Saturday night live when that album came out. So everyone had a chance to hear real hardcore music and decide, is this for me or is this not for me? And the answer was overwhelmingly, this is not for me. I bought this album for the fucking rap songs or the other <laughs> shit The other shit this band does, which is hey, good, sab- too. I like sab- all of it. Sabotage is pretty close to being a hardcore band, and it got over huge. Well, that yeah. Little John song, the Stop Fucking With Me, I think Don't Fuck With Me, the Sample Slayer, that's like one of the greatest hardcore songs ever. Oh yeah, and we forgot big takeover sample in uh the BC Boys big comeback song past the mic. Yeah, man. Ben, you got a final take on this? I uh, I think we've uh we've exhausted this topic. I don't know. I I don't have a final take. I I think I've all my opinions are out there in the universe for you to fucking absorb. <laughs> but he's still got 10 sentences out, so respect. <laughs> um all right, shout out to Andy Diehard and the band Ill Communication. What's up? You know, son, you, you're not a kid anymore. Oh, no, I go to shows. Dad, I already know all this stuff. Well, they don't teach you about everything. At shows. Okay, Mr. Smarty Bands? So just listen. When boys and girls get a little older, they start getting interested in punk and hardcore subgenres. Starter Kit. All right, we're going to have Pops break down First Wave Boston Starter Kit. What's up? Ready for it. Okay, I want to give a little, you know, lay of the land before we do this. So Boston's an interesting city because it's a transient city due to all the colleges and turnover and the fact that the population goes up so much in the fall when all this new blood comes in. And that makes it a music city, a music city, but it's had an odd history because if you think of kind of the wheelhouse of punk rock, Boston was still kind of doing garage bands and pub rock they weren't really doing the kind of you know they don't have these like um these bands that you would identify with punk that was going around the rest of the united states so you kind of but then you have these other interesting things like you have the modern lovers which some people argue is the first punk band at the same time you know after the modern lovers you have the real kids dmz willie willie alexander Nervous Eaters, The Neighborhoods, The Liars, La Peste. And then you have Mission to Burma, who some of them came over from Detroit. 
but everything's still kind of garage rock with the exception of Burma. Um, so there's kind of no quintessential first wave Boston punk band. You maybe say the cars, but not really, um, you know, still leaning to new wave. And the reason I mentioned Burma, they're kind of interesting because, you know, they're influenced by the Stooges, Stooges and also television. And they were part of this scene happening in Boston in the late seventies and the early eighties. And it was centered around this club called the underground in Austin. And that's where joy division was, was supposed to play one of their first U S shows later new order played there super tiny club, like a hundred people, the cure played there. And there was this interesting art punk scene. So in a weird way, Boston kind of like fast forwards from punk to just post punk really quickly. And there's, if you are not aware of this label called propeller records, and you're interested in kind of angular punk, say stuff in the certain ratio gang of four zone and kind of just outsider music, they have a bunch of compilations. The records are really cheap and there's some really cool stuff on there. And a lot of those people went on to do really interesting things. Um, and then just to go back to Burma quickly, as much as they predated hardcore, they also saw Boston hardcore happening. You know, they have, you know, at the last show they play, they have negative effects open up. There's a riot. There's really great audio and video of that. And people who are around then, specifically Al Quinn had mentioned that he felt like Burma was influenced by hardcore in this weird uh, art rock mashup they were doing. And you can kind of see like, not that they're writing hardcore songs, but their tempos are speeding up and they're doing all these things that are kind of interesting, getting louder. So I thought that was like cool to mention. So then that starts off on my playlist, 1979, Mission to Burma, Peking Spring. It's an up-tempo song. It's super um like springy right it's very it's a very like sprightly song it's anthemic and then at the end it goes into this slowed down more than half time part that is we can call it like a proto mosh part we don't have to dissect it but i think that's a cool starting point for this list and then so in tandem you have these um we'll say propeller bands playing the underground and then you have the gallery east scene which is where SSD control and the true Boston hardcore scene starts. And what's kind of funny is like, they're, you know, how much art can you take? They're trying to get away from art, but the only place they can play is this art gallery. And so that becomes the crux of the scene before the channel, when hardcore gets bigger. And I'm just going to kind of burn through the bands on this list. Um, you know, you can, you can check out the singular songs, but I want to speak to why they're chosen. So, Starting it off after Burma with Gangrene, I just think so many bands have talked about who were around at the time, Misfits specifically, stating that they were, you know, Glenn was so enamored with the speed of Gangrene and the tunefulness that it had an influence on Earth AD, which I think is interesting to bring up. So, you you know, the two songs on here, Kilikami is a little more in that like speedy, beat it out style and then sold out, which is another track I chose showed some different dynamics and kind of their sense of humor. And it wasn't about just going as fast as possible. And it was about mixing it up and kind of, I guess, foreshadowing. And I think the thing that gets a little lost on gang green is how they were always a very formed band that was, they were like aware of the performance and they were kind of like, you know, kids of the big rock generation that were ready to light up a room. Uh, next up, have to go with SSD control. I mean, they had, I think the definitive sound, it's so brawny. They had the mission statement. What I think is funny, you know, they don't pick songs from uh, the Get It Away EP just because they're on Spotify. On this record, it's very muddy. It's very um, dense recording. In the fast parts, you can't really tell what the drums are doing, which is kind of awesome. It's just kind of that like hit it, hit it before you quit it vibe. But um, picked glue, obviously an anthem. But I also really loved, uh, especially as a kid, Force Down. And I think that song is really important, especially in the canon of Straight Edge, because it did more than just speak to defiance. The lyrics actually articulately break out why this culture sucks. It's, you know, it's, it's, 
I think those songs are important. You know, you can rally behind things, but having this way of conveying, like, this is why something isn't cool is, is super powerful. And those people doing it were the right ones. Um, threw DOIS in there right after, cause it's a brother band. And I think what's kind of interesting of that record is the brotherhood record. It's all over the place, you know, more than fashion, such a great tune, but the record, like a lot of the time, the distortion's coming from the bass rather than the guitars. The guitars can be really tinny. And then you have some songs that are a little sus, like Girls Got Limits and Escape. Um, but, uh, you know, Wolf Pack is an incredible song as well, even if it's kind of a take, it's kind of a riff on a riff of like the SSD structure, that super caveman rhythmic um, declaration. But, I, you know, I think they have to be included and then we'll go for a hybrid last rights negative effects. I think chunks, the song, it kind of shows one side of choke where he could go, or it's a little more, a little more oi influenced, a little more sing songy and just kind of like grip it and rip it. And then on the other side, citizens arrest by negative effects. It's sort of that classic hit everything, watch the fuck out mosh parts coming. And even though it's not the beefiest recording, it's a very like threatening song. And um, getting to the FUs, I, I really think they're an interesting band. You know, DYS and SSD get the collector shine, but Jerry's Kids, Jerry's Kids and FUs are kind of the other side of the coin. Very like great players. Uh, poor, poor, fit, pitiful you. It sounds a little more West Coast, but it's still crunchy. And then I wanted to highlight the song uh, "Unite or Lose" because. Growing up, bands would always cover that song. It was just so catchy. It was almost like a, you'd hear someone playing it and think they were doing a seven seconds cover or something. And you kind of, it's one of those songs that you know before you know it. And I think it's just a great underrated, you know, another anthemic tune. And uh, go right into Jerry's Kids, just ripper of a band. And everyone I've talked to who saw that band at the time. They'd sing the praises of SSD, but then they'd always say, Jerry's Kid is just the full package, like presentation, sound always on point, dynamics always on point, something like super captivating about what they do. And I, I just, I think everyone should go back and listen to those those records, even Kill, Kill, Kill. It's just great stuff. And then quickly burn through kind of the outliers. You know, you can't, you have to talk about the freeze. They were there you know, arguably earlier, I think they're a little more traditional hardcore slash punk or 1.5, you know, want to give Cape Cod a little shine. And, you know, even I think this song that I picked is really interesting because it's critiquing people who do fanzines and excluding people and being too pro. It makes me want to think, you know, it makes me think like, who are they talking about? Right. Like who was doing, who is excluding them from the scene? And also you can, you can hear the dude say hardcore in the song. And that's pretty fucking awesome. And then proletariat, I guess they're kind of a East coast analog to saccharine trust in a way. It's very UK sounding. It's not, you know, um, the beefy sound you expect from Boston. There's not a lot of bravado. And I would just say, go deep in that catalog. Cause a lot of the stuff isn't on Spotify, but they're great records and they kind of get a little more influenced by gang of four later on and play a little more angular. And then lastly, um, putting siege on there uh, for me, discovering that band. And then anytime, anytime in the nineties, I would hear someone name check siege. I was like, that band's worth peeping. Like they know something it's a secret handshake. And, you know, I think what's interesting about them, they weren't from Boston proper. I believe they're from Weymouth, Mass. And, you know, some bands are ignored in their time and spawn genres. And I don't think that's uh, talking too big about Siege. Like they definitely spawned, you know, people argue they started Blast Beats. They influenced Napalm Death. There's, you know, so many bands with black and white record covers that drive right back to Siege. I'd almost call them the Velvet Underground of hardcore. Uh, their their influence is like that important, and it's kind of nice that it's understated. But 
yeah, that's that's my that's my intro to. Uh, I wanted to give you the spectrum of the early years. I think this is an absolutely great starter kit. Um, I love everything on it. The songs you picked are perfect, and yeah, you, you give some really nice branches too, like to branch out. It's like kind of exactly what we want in a starter kit. Ben, what's your take on this? Oh man, where do I start? Okay, Mission of Burma. I think of them as like the U.S. Um, version of Wire. Like they're the they're the U.S. post punk band of that era. And I saw them in 2002 when they reunited. And there are a few interesting things about that band. One is that their sound guy is is an official member of the band. Like they're like fuck it, we're calling our sound guy like. A, am I right about this, Pops? Like their their sound guy yeah. is a band member. Yeah, yeah, because he was. They're doing like well, they used to do analog tape loops with Martin Swope, but you know Bob Weston, he was doing sound manipulations during the sets, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and one of them has uh, tinnitus, so he wears those Fred Hammer like uh, mm-hmm. you know air like uh, air airport employee um, headphones to keep him his ears intact it's and a shooting range like ear protection exactly and and it's funny i've heard this song a Stay million times i've Stay heard this strapped, song <laughs> sorry yeah sure let's go to the, the firing range you've, you you you've got my number um the this song peking spring i've heard it a million times but i never noticed that there totally is a mosh part in this song and it's not just like oh it's an indie rock band that has a section of the song that has a slower tempo. Let's call it a mosh part. This mosh part, if you just made the guitars more distorted and Ray Capo sang over it, it would be, it would be a youth of today song. Like the beat is the same as when youth of today plays breakdowns. The chords are what youth of today would play. Like it really is that. So that was cool. Um, uh gangrene good yeah, let's, band let's, let's jump in on mission of burma before we yeah yeah okay you you can take us through the uh the playlist but dan what do you have on mission of burma i've always viewed uh mission of burma as kind of like the boston talking heads they were there at the kind of start of this but they're a bit more arty than the than the the what's regarded as the like spark do you know what i mean and i swear to god i i don't know if he did he probably did but like johnny marr definitely when i hear the guitar playing of mission of burma like i always think like well here's where rem and the smiths you know listen to this in some of their formation um, what I love about Mission of Burma is that they can have the catchiest parts and then the most tangent. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I echo everything all three of you have said about this being a proto slash consistent mosh part, which is really interesting. And I, I love that we dived into this song in particular. Yeah, this song rules so hard. And like the f- the first time I listened to it, I was like, man, it really doesn't need like that last part. You know, like, because it's kind of out of nowhere. Like, mm-hmm. It's not It's not like a seamless transition to the mosh part, which is hilarious, us calling it the mosh part. But uh, <laughs> but then it just, like, takes off and, like, turns into this really special thing. This song is amazing. I'm so glad it's on the playlist. Ben, take us to Gang Green. Okay. But before we go there, I'm, I'm curious when Peking Spring was recorded because it wasn't released until after the band broke up. I'm looking at Discogs, but Discogs has let me down before. So maybe, maybe it was recorded, true. supposedly recorded in 1979. It came out on that Forget compilation, which is a bunch of odds and ends. But as far as I know, it's one of their earliest recorded songs and there's footage of them playing it. Uh, in those expanded reissues at the underground, which I mentioned, which had to be 80. So super interesting. Wow. That, I mean, 1979, the only other band I can think of that had actually had mosh parts was bad brains, black dots demo. So that is really fucking early. Um, the gangrene, the thing that always confused me about gangrene is their first album actually comes out in 1986, which is another wasted night. And then you have this preschool collection 
which is what the songs that you grabbed are from. But I'm kind of unclear on, and I've owned this CD for a million years, what these record, what these songs were originally recorded for and how they actually came out or in the first place. What was the situation? So most, most of them were on Boston, not LA, which Boston, not LA is not on Spotify. So that's why I gripped it from there. I see. Yeah. yeah. But, but I don't know because there's so many tunes. I don't know if it was a demo. I'm not sure. I believe, I feel like there's a Curtis Tang interview I heard recently where he kind of broke it down. So we can fact check that. Right. Um, boss, this is Boston, not LA and unsafe at any speed. There's a CD that combines both those comps. And those are basically the entire Boston hardcore scene, not include, not including the straight edge bands from Boston. Like you have everything on that plus the straight edge bands and you have Boston, you have the pretty much all of Boston hardcore. Would you agree with that? For sure. And those bands weren't on it in protest, which is really funny because think of how cool those records would be if SSD and DYS were recorded, uh, included. <laughs> They'd be yeah. totally complete. I know that's wild. This gangrene stuff. I love it so much. It is like as fast as you can get without getting sloppy. Like the drummer is just amazing. I, I wonder about that. Sometimes we talked about it on the Brad Logan podcast with, talking about uh, F minus, like do you decide to be this fast or do you just roll with it? Cause you figure out like your drummer can actually do that. You know, like this is wild style and like very early, this guy's like absolutely amazing. And they do show that they got like the musical chops. Like they could have done other stuff, but they decided to play hardcore. Cause like when they're joking at the beginning of that sold out song, like it is very like musical. Like they can mm-hmm. just write a pop. They can be a pop band. What I love know? about that song is, yeah, they're they're showing that the sold out part is that part, and then it's almost like a reverse sell out, like where they go, give them what they want, and then they go to full blown blasting hardcore. But that first part sounds like it could be Credence or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's um, wild. Uh, it's really tuneful. It's really thing, and then they come back into it, and then they go back into give them what they want. You know, it's it's fucking sick. And the um, punk rock sense of humor is is still intact. You know, they're making both these songs are really humorous. Well, even writing the logo out in fake coke on the on the, <laughs> uh, you know, because I imagine if that was real coke, then that would have been a very expensive album cover. <laughs> Yeah, and the last thing they ever did in their lives, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. yeah um, going into yeah. SSD, this is like the songs you chose were great because it really does highlight that SSD is just such a wild band, and so much of it is like tribal and rhythmic, and not like straightforward textbook hardcore. Like it's just raging wildness and. It it would be very hard to describe to someone, right? I think it's like a band that you actually have to listen to. You can't like explain how they sound. Ben, what's your take on this? I agree with that. Like, I imagine they were influenced by Minor Threat because they're a straight edge band. I mean, there wasn't anything really before them that was claiming straight edge, even though Minor Threat wasn't technically claiming straight edge. Whatever, you get what I'm saying. They were influenced by Minor Threat, no question. And Black Flag, you know, that, when Black Flag got a second guitarist, it inspired all these other bands, including SSD, to get a second guitarist. But, like, this band does not sound like Minor Threat, and this band does not sound like Black Flag. They are their own thing. And there's nothing the, – the main thing that sets them apart from those two bands is there's nothing musical about them. Almost nothing <laughs> musical about them. There's just, like – it's just, like, pure power and, like, rage and just, like, a wall of – hardcore sound (laughs) yeah i almost wonder if like it's one of those things where they're influenced by black flag but then they influence black flag right because like like the long ring outs that they're doing on the symbols is like kind of a like a trope that black flag would do so much later and blast would do and so forth like not going like a straight rhythm like do da 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 like almost like the slowdowns and yeah it almost just comes back around Dan, the, other, the other weird thing real quick is that 
they talk about like discharge being such a huge influence on them. And to be honest, I like, they're almost the opposite of that. Like they're, they have so many more dynamics, but maybe that's the secret sauce, right? <laughs> that it's cause they're, they're you know, discard discharge is like kind of like all go no slow for the most part. And this thing is, and they're just all over the place, but I don't know. It's whatever that mashup is, it works. And I love it. Yeah, I mean, SSD does harness, like, a pulse in a way, where Discharge is, like, it is, like, a all-go, like, pulse. And SSD is, like, falling into, like, a, I don't know, it's, like, a rhythmic pulse, but there is something, like, pulsating through the music. Dan, what's your take on this stuff? It There's no band that has ever been able to harness the sound of what SSD is. It's a a complete planet to themselves do you know what i mean yeah the, they're obviously influenced by black flag they're obviously influenced by man of threat even on glue the boom, doo, doo, like it's almost like a serene like rowboat on a on a river but then holy shit there's a giant waterfall coming and then it flies down that when the song kicks in it so i feel like that part is kind of influenced by greg ginn a bit but then when they go fast and they go hard, it's their own sound completely. There's nothing like it. It's so different. It's so, it's vibe more than anything. It's just anger personified, but with with an attempt to express that same anger through music and not just screaming. Do you know what I mean? They it, Like they had to be a band that wrote the songs like in a room. Like it had to be a dude with a drummer. These are not bedroom riffs. This is not like one guitarist like writing shit in the room. Like it's it's like jamming. It it's has to be. It's definitely mm-hmm. jamming, but he's definitely the general. No, Alan, for sure, for sure, general, for sure. Know? But it's like writing with a drummer for like for sure. It's not yeah. like a dude writing in his head. He has to feel the power. You yeah. know. Ben, let's go on to DYS and Last Rites and Negative Effects. Let's put these guys together. All right, these are kind of the other straight edge ish bands. I guess none of these bands were like one hundred percent straight edge members, but that was like normal for the early eighties. But they were claiming it. Whatever they had X's on their hands and they fucking sang about how you shouldn't do drugs. Close enough. DYS is like I always think of them as like the little brother band of SSD. Like they like their record. They like put out a record the year after SSD does. They go they go hard rock like the year after SSD does maybe at the same time, but the records come out a little bit later and like, it's a little bit more straight down the middle, traditional hardcore for this first album for brotherhood, you know, more than fashion is a li- it's de- There is a little, there is the SSD flavor in it, but it's a little less out there. Um, in the first riff, but then they dial it in. Right. Yeah, it's easier. I think it's it, this would be an easier record to grasp for someone who's not uh, acclimated to SSD yet. And then Last Rites, this song Chunks, speaking of Discharge, reminds me of one of the few slow Discharge songs, State Violence, State Control, a real kind of mid-tempo chugging song. And I love it. It's one of the best songs of this whole you know, region slash era. And they only history ever, Earth. it's one of the best songs in the history of earth, Ben. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the, and the dinosaur junior cover is awesome. And you just read <laughs> my, the next note on my oh. fucking notes, but yes, All right, I'm going to shut up. Damn it. <laughs> but, but this is interesting because the only show last rights ever played was in Western Massachusetts. And I assume in the audience were, members of deep wound who then formed dinosaur junior um, because that's where they were from. And then negative, negative effects is pre last rights. This is all choke, you know, choke was in negative effects, then last rights, then slap shot. And so negative effects is more kind of raw, brutal, straightforward, hardcore kind of simple beats. Um, it's good. I never thought it was as good as Last Rites, but uh, Restraining Order, I think, is the current band that's keeping that negative effects Last Rites sound alive um, in uh, yeah. 2021. 
And they're from Western Mass in Connecticut too. They're from that same region that, you know, Dinosaur Jr. Deep Wound are from. So that's kind of probably coincidental. Yeah. Like the last three songs that come out are absolute bangers, but Negative Effects does have more output. Dan, what's your take on this stuff? I mean, Choke can do no wrong. It's, he, I mean, well, he can. There's no, you can't. You, it, you keep it, your mouth shut about the uh, the <laughs> Veterans Day episode, dude. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be epic. Um, but I mean, there's an argument to be said that Chunks is the best song out of Boston ever. You know, that could be a good argument. I mean, we've had that argument. We did a Boston Super Seven. Go back and listen. And I didn't pick Chunks, but I do back it. And you chose side B on the Chunk 7-inch on a side A, side B episode. That's true, because that day I was just... It, it's just so oi, and I was just <laughs> feeling my oats on the oi world, you know, that day. And also, it's just nice to counterpoint, you know, and <laughs> uh, you know to give some shine to something else from time to time. But if we were picking today, Chunks wins. Um what I will say is that, you know, I, I do think Last Rites, just the, the I, I suppose, the more punkness of it compared to negative effects, um, or the more, like, just rawness, I like uh, better. But, I mean, th- this, this whole playlist is just chock-a-block, great, great, great hardcore. Yeah, let's go on and, and, and put the next three together as well. So FU's two songs, the Jerry's Kids, and the Freeze. Ben, kick it off. Um, FU's, uh, they put out Kill for Christ in 82, My America 83, and then they take a little bit of a right turn in 84 with Do We Really Want to Hurt You? Now, the thing is, a, a lot of these first-generation hardcore bands, if they stuck around into the mid-80s, they started going hard rock. And almost without exception, became really bad hard rock bands. And I say almost without exception because the FUs actually became a better band when they turned when they started putting hard rock in their sound. I think. Do we really want to hurt you? Not on the playlist. I understand though because we're talking about the you know the very early days. But there's a song on that called "Young Fast Iranians," which I think is a friggin' masterpiece. And as as a straight up hardcore band like uh kill for christ my america era never really did much for me uh good n- not something i revisit very much jerry's kids the thing about jerry's kids is the beats on this record sound like if you took an entire drum kit and just threw them down a flight of stairs but if the drums hit rhythmically in in time to the music because this guy, this drummer is doing more roles than an actual regular beat. Like if you, if you actually counted the, the amount of time he's doing roles, it's going to be greater than just the straight beat, which is like, holy shit, this guy loves doing roles. And it's like almost distracting, but there's a great song on this album called uh, Crucify Me, which um, I want to say I played it for Graham Kleiss just before we start started fields of fire and he goes jerry's kids is my favorite band in the world and for like three weeks jerry's kids was his favorite band ever and then he discovered blast and it was all over um the freeze i'm glad pops mentioned that that uh the bane of uh zach's existence that dreaded number 1.5 because when we went back and reassessed all this music for that article me and daniel weitzman wrote uh, it hit me like, oh my god, Freeze is totally that. They're they're absolutely that middle ground between punk and hardcore. Land of the Lost, Rabid Reaction, those first two albums. It's funny every time I hear that Land of the Lost album, I think this is so good. Why don't I listen to this more often? And then I never do listen to it more often. But they are great, and th- there is something musical about them that kind of gets lost in the sauce when the bands get really, really fast you know, circa 82 FU's Jerry's kids kind of vibe. So that's what I got for these, ba- this set of bands. Yeah. The freeze stuff is like very, 
it's like early OC esque almost. Like it's like Angry Simone style. Yep. Being like tongue in cheek, like right there musically and like lyrically. So it is cool. This Jerry's Kid song though, <laughs> it's such a rager, dude. Cause like it's not even a riff. Like, and I love the way they end it. It's like so triumphant. And then like that fast, hard fade on it. It's like, dude, I'm listening to this thing three times in a row. Fuck it. You know, like, but it's not a riff. Like they're not writing a riff. It's just, it's literally like three notes in like a standard, like scale. Da, da, da. Like just nice sounding basic ass notes, but it's so early and there's so much like fury behind it that it's just like, oh my God, this is perfect hardcore that like can't be replicated. And the FU stuff, I, I strongly disagree with Ben. I had like some like bootleg LP that was like the, do you really want us to hurt you on one side? And one of the first ones on the other side. And it was just like, yeah, I can't get down with the, the third LP that much. But I will check out. Ben, I know you'll text me after this and, and remind me that song so I can check it out. Dan, what's your take on this stuff? Well, the drummer of Jerry's Kids is a huge uh, Safaris fan. <laughs> is you know what's funny is like that ties into the graham kleiss story right because i've enjoyed surf music for like a long time and i always wondered like what the fuck happened to it because it was so huge for a long time and then it just went away and i found out that surf was like the biggest music in the country before the beatles hit yep so like literally it was like huge and then people are like oh shit choruses are the shit and it's kind of the same right like Jerry's kids is like Graham's favorite band for the three weeks before he discovers blast. And then there's no going back. It's like, there's no post blast Graham and there's no post like surf after the Beatles. Yeah. Well put. That's all I got, Dan. Move on. Um, yeah. I, now oh, Dan, I, have you ever seen that movie? Uh, Kung Fu hustle. <laughs> yeah. Shaolin soccer. Um, I think the, Oh god! Now, now we've got off on such a tangent. <laughs> where we're talking about the Beatles. <laughs> um, F use Jerry's kids freeze. Yes. Okay. So the freeze were one of the bands that, like, when I was really first getting into punk, like I had a freeze uh, cassette, and there was one song that had the catchiest chorus, and now I can't remember what the name of the song is, and I should definitely go down a freeze wormhole, but it was it was a song that I rewound so much that I like listened to that same chorus because it had the most aggressive but melodic sound in it, and I think that's what the freeze encapsulates really well, is that they're giving you melody, but it's it's coming at you at, like a train you know not not necessarily as fast as safari's jerry kids uh dude is giving it to you but it, it's it's aggressive it's melody that could be on the radio but played with such aggression that's that's kind of what some of the free songs are like and uh the fu's i've never really dived in that much and uh this this uh, that's the great thing about a starter kit this is giving me something to sink my teeth into yeah uh, Pops, can you pronounce the next band so I don't sound like I was born with no thumbs? The Proletariat. That's They're, it. The Proletariat. Uh, ben and Dan, were you aware of this band and were you a fan of them before this playlist? Yes. A Proletariat, I've had that discography CD for 20 years and I rarely revisit it. And the song Pops picked for the playlist is so friggin' good. I am going to revisit it. And the proletariat stand out to me as being very UK influenced, almost to the point where he's kind of doing an English accent and uh, f- lyrically very crass, musically very gang of four. Um, and then Siege is a band I could never get into. I They were kind of sold to me as proto power violence. And since I'm not, that's not my scene, I'm very curious for people who do know a lot about that, that scene, what did the early nineties power violence bands add to the formula that siege created that made them different? Like why isn't siege just a power violence band, uh, you know, retro labeled 
retroactively labeled power violence band. What was it? I, maybe it's maybe those those early '90s bands added those really really slow mosh parts in between the super fast parts. Maybe that's it. Is that's that what I was going to say because they were coming. A lot of those early power violence bands were still just thinking of themselves as hardcore bands influenced by stuff that was a little more obscure, but they're still kind of like operating in the, in that structure, whereas siege doesn't have that structure. They're all over the place. And I think that's what it, I think that's what it was. If we were to boil it down, it's just that they were putting these wild elements in a format that was a little more palatable. It's not the super speed scissor beat or like the super slow mosh parts and they're not mushed together as much. Like it really is like the proto of that stuff. And it's like, it's still like catchy, straightforward, hardcore. I love this stuff. I haven't listened to it a long time. It's like an LP that I used to listen to. And uh, yeah, this song coming on the playlist was like a total palate cleanser after like the previous one. Well, what, so. what's interesting about siege and interesting about a point pops made is the velvet underground. Like, <laughs> It, what's interesting about that is, you know, people say, you know, not many people saw the Velvet Underground, but they went on to influence the world. It Siege is kind of like that. Like Japanese hardcore references Siege. I mean, a lot of Japanese hardcore, not holistically, but a lot of the gnarly Japanese hardcore that came out in the 80s, you know, Siege is a big influence. Uh, like you say, the power violence stuff, infest, etc. Siege is a big influence. It's like um, it's a band that almost its influences, uh, its being name checked as an influence is what has made the band live on uh, even more than probably listenership. Yeah, it rules. It rules. All right, final takes, pops. You feel good about our takes on this stuff? These are great takes. The only thing I'd add is that you can pick it up. It's a discount buy, but Seeds reunited in the early 90s, played a couple shows with Seth Putnam, RIP, on vocals, and they did a 7-inch with him. And that thing is a fucking unsurprising – like it was a surprising ripper and has no bearing on this list, but I just want to throw it in there as a little like uh, hidden gem to peep you probably get it for six bucks we should have done a collector's bargain corner god damn it we haven't done that in a while that would have been perfect all right ben final thoughts um siege has a cd but it only ever came out of mexico <laughs> i'll look for it for you next time i'm down there uh this weekend thanks appreciate it yeah. uh, i think i'm just going camping but uh dan final thoughts boston hardcore is very much of what it is. It's very hard nosed, working class, hard, but it's also got nods to intellectualism and art and um, looking for the light in the dark, really. You know, there's a lot of um, pulling out fun melody out of the hardest riffs ever. Like, so Boston has continued to do that, like, over time and time again. And Boston is very similar to what we've name checked in the past of like Oxnard and Chula Vista and things like that, where they've been very uh, bands that are coming in the future are looking back to the historical roots of their city for influence and not just looking elsewhere. And I think this is a great starting point to listen to Boston music um, and Boston music rules. Most Bostonians don't. And uh, Boston sports teams. <laughs> Not tonight. Oh, wait, I dated the pod. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and Aerosmith really sucks. Almost as yeah. bad as the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So, uh, They're worse. But the band Boston rules. And I'm not being uh, ironic, sarcastic. Hey, Ben, you got more than a feeling. How do you do, fellow kids? What? How do you do, fellow kids? What? How do you do, fellow kids? All right, we're going to talk a couple newer-ish records. First up, the band Headcount from San Diego, the LP, or 12-inch EP, is called Imprint. Comes out on Safe Inside Records, or it came out. Not sure of the release date. Bert, update your website. 
Dan, what do you think about this? This is absolutely amazing. It's killer, hardcore, straight ahead. Um, youth crew would be a term to use, suppose you know, as a as a catch all for this. But it's it's a bit more than that. There's some s- super aggressive parts, but for the most part, it 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 gives me life. I love this. Um, now the mu- the recording is really good, but there's an interesting choice of how the vocals are with the music, and I'm still I'm still tackling it. You know, I don't know if I would like the vocals cleaner and more up front. I think I would, but it is definitely. Um, a choice and it is what's making this sound different from most things that are kind of like this out there. So it's definitely making my ears prick up and me listen to it more, you know, um, there's really cool lyrics. There's, um, the kind of lead off single that they, they teased us with the anti cop always baby ACAB, a new, a new iteration for those, uh, for that acronym um, is a really cool, uh, thoughtful, basically fuck you to police, (laughs) a thoughtful fuck you to police. Um, And uh, the artwork's really cool. It gives me, um, so even though it probably doesn't summon anything like what, their visual representation when i still see it it still gives me like a turning point vibe (laughs) um but yeah i I really love this and i very much recommend it to everyone listening to the pod to check out and you know grab it from safe inside i think it's good people doing good music um modern mike is now in the band so they just went from a, a nine to a 13 in out of 10 in awesome dude alert for the band. So check them out. They're really good and a great live. Yeah. It sounds so fresh because the drumming is so great. Like this drummer kicks ass and the recording is bright. The bass tone is awesome. Like really just everything sounds good and fresh. Like I totally dig it. It's straight down the middle hardcore, which is why you're saying like youth crew ish, right? Because it doesn't, it's not heavy, but it's like, is fast and gnarly without sounding like whack, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how to break it down. It's just straightforward, <laughs> good hardcore. And usually when, when you're doing like the right over the, like right over the plate hardcore, it can sound stale or sound safe. And like, I don't think this does because it's very intense. Like, and again, I just think the, the drumming is great and makes it like stand apart. Ben, what's your take on this stuff? I've noticed Zach, that for someone who is not a drummer, you really focus in on the drums on, when we talk about music on this podcast. Have you noticed that about yourself? Well, I think that like it's one of the things about hardcore, right? Like if your drummer sucks, your band sucks. Like it's kind of like the the ticket at the door. You know, if you don't have the ticket, you can't get in the door. If you're if you don't have like a good drummer, like your band sucks. Like that's kind of it, right? Yeah, I think the same could probably be said about any sort of kind of any music that has that has a drummer that has drums. But we're but not no, talking about be, well, you could be competent in other stuff, right? Like I know it's low hanging fruit, but people always talk about like Lars Ulrich being a shitty drummer, and of course he's not a shitty drummer. But compared to like other heavy metal drummers, he's not like amazing, you know. But he's competent for that. But you don't listen to Metallica and be like. Hell yeah, the drumming's sick. You know, it's just it's good enough for the band. You know, it doesn't right. fall apart. But it's not like a standout thing. Or like this, I listened to. I was like, ooh, their drummer's really good, and so it like gives the band a leg forward. Totally. Yeah. Um. This sounds this rec- head count record sounds like it could have come out on Livewire Records circa two thousand one. It because it's like straight down the middle, straight edge hardcore, and it's it's sort of youth crew but it doesn't lean into those corny cliches of youth crew like it doesn't have the like we're gonna you know unite the scene like there's none of that (laughs) (laughs) and 
it also doesn't rely on those minor chord progressions of those early 2000s bridge nine bands. So it's not B9 chord and it's not really youth crew, but it does have that sort of 20 years ago vibe about it. And um, it kind of reminds me of that band, Our Turn. Do you remember that band? They were on Youngblood. Carl mm-hmm. Cordova was a singer. Yeah, yeah. a little kind of reminds me of them. Or that carry on demo. I think it was actually a live recording that they did between the second and the third seven inch that never came out. I mean, it was not properly recorded, but done before the second seven inch actually. Okay. So before line is drawn and there was a song on it called first steps or something like that, but this is before the first step existed, but like kind of that, those two things I'm getting vibes. Um, I don't know if there's a standout track of the six songs on the 12 inch. To me, there wasn't one, except I really like the song title anti cop always baby. Like I picture Telly Savala saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a cop. Oh, Telly uh, Savala. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> he's an actor. Yeah. yeah. Pops, what's your take on this stuff? I want to echo what Ben said. Because I was listening to this, and it's it's always weird for me to reference something I was a part of. But I was like, I'm getting kind of like, like, are we far enough away that this is semi youth crew revival of a youth crew revival without the tropes in a way? You know, from the recording to the song structures, there's a lot of like those those like late '90s, early 2000s, like choky riffs not choke the singer, but like, you know, muted riffs, um, accents, but there's also kind of this like vintage nemesis hardcore vibe to it too. It's very like, it, it sounds like where it's from. So it's not, it's not amorphous. And I guess that's what I'm saying. It like doesn't play into any tropes and the song titles aren't like, Oh, let's take a lyric from something else, or like we'll twist like a line from an Alone in the Crowd song. No, it's a song title. So I think that gives it personality. I th- I really liked how hot the vocals sound and how like courtesified they are, but they totally have their own character. And I that's like my overall take for this record is that it's doing a bunch of things like, you know, everyone was saying down the middle, but it has so much character that it just rips. And I just I just went into this thing like, I don't want to know anything about this band. I just want to listen to it. And um, yeah, there's, you know, I like, there's some really cool, like clangy bass intros. The song Stolen Time, it it has some like references to Circle so- Circle Storm song, No Time to Sit Around. Um, I had a couple notes here. Yeah, the song Parse, it has like a phrasing that's kind of borrowed from small man, big mouth, but then it goes into this nineties verse and then it kind of goes into this like uniform choicey part. And then it has a surf mosh and there's echo in the surf mosh. So they're definitely being uniform choicey. And, um, and then I want to talk about anti-cop always baby. I do have a critique of it. It's missing a comma. So (laughs) it's a little confusing to me. But aside from that, also the acronym would just be AAB, but that's just me getting grammatically correct. But anyways, um, there's some definite what's wrong with me, uh, the faith vibes in the in the verse. And then again, it goes into this like UC kind of thing. So I don't know. For me, along with the drumming, it's just super dynamic without being like too wild. Like we're trying to be we're trying to be flashy. And the thing I always just hone in on is like, if you're going to go and be super traditional, then that puts a lot of weight on the singer to like, all right, you have to bring some character. You can't be like hooked on phonics, man. You know, like that's not going to cut it. You can't be the loud talker. And that's the opposite of what's happening here where I'm just sucked in and I'm into the phrasing and the, the grit of the voice and the urgency. So highly recommend it. I really enjoyed being turned on to this. Well, it's interesting that you talk about um, a revival of a revival. I think what it benefits from is a synthesizing of what's come before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Liking stuff from the original Youth Crew Wave, liking stuff from 
the you know the ninety six ninety seven revival, and then liking stuff from you know what could be potentially referred to as amazing core or whatever. You know, it's it's kind of synthesizing what this band is synthesizing what it's liked that's come before and carving a new path with what it does, you know, like it's not completely referential. They're doing their own thing. Um, and what's interesting about, you know, like you talking about like the vocal placement or the, like the vocal melodies and things like that. He's a drummer that a really good drummer that singing in this band. So I think there's, some kind of like something that can really uh when drummers sing they can really sink into where they kind of want the words to fall um but did no one else mentioned the the processing on the vocals uh does it is it just me that it's really sticking out to why you gotta be a hater why you gotta be a hater i mean that's what that was the way i referred to it as sounding really hot that's like my fucking techie term but yeah i picked up on that and one thing i want to back up on is like when i say when i call this referential that's not a negative term like i'm gonna i'm gonna say this it sounds like a positive pastiche to me (laughs) i like that i like that i also like the critiquing of grammar you know (laughs) it's missing a comma and should be missing a hyphen in order for it to be acab exactly uh, yeah. So, hey, there might still be time to correct that. We'll see. <laughs> Definitely not. With like the pressing plants being so slow, they probably put this order in in February. All right. Well, no, you just get a little marker out, dude. How many are you making? Five hundred. Let's go. I know limited covers, dude. With it corrected, what's up? <laughs> well, you know? Would the comma be after cop or after always? Cop, right? Well, yeah, before baby, right? Because. It's like always anti cop, comma, baby. Come on, Ben, you know this. You wrote a book. Well, it'd be like if it's Telly Savala style, it's after cop. So it goes anti cop, yeah. always, baby. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, because right now it's just anti cop, always, baby. And I'm like, fuck, dude. What's up with but, this, always, baby? But it's, sure if, it's after, if it's before this the baby. Great mystery. This yeah. is a great mystery. We don't know how they're phrasing it. So we, we're going to have to get them on here and get some clarification. Either way, like from everything, you know, it's funny that Pops is on the pod because there definitely is some love to IME on this, I feel. Um, But I think every person listening to this right now, throw this on your Spotify, order it from Safe Inside. You won't go wrong. Yeah, handle business, people. All right, the next record we're going to talk about is The Chisel. They put out a flexi seven inch called Enough Said War Dance Records 2021. And good God, man, this thing bangs. Enough Said, good song. What I see, Dan, I better get the right role because I want this on my 2021 playlist. This is the best song of the year. What do you think? <laughs> it's it's up there for me too. I mean, we both are in extreme agreement on this song. Um, lyrically, and musically, this is this is why it, you're referring to it as the best song I am too, because the tunefulness of it and the way the verses are more tuneful than the chorus makes this so good. And lyrically, what it's saying is about you know the media is just fucking up society. You know, it's just fucking us up and we are fighting amongst ourselves as working class people and people are just getting over on it. And God, what an amazing song. I really urge everyone to listen to this ASAP. Yeah. And like the lo-fi recording plays into it because like they hit those like really nice notes in like the choruses and you almost like can't tell what it is. Like, is it the guitarist hitting note? Is it a... like a piano? Is it a keyboard? Is it a xylophone? Like, what is it? It just sounds nice. And it's yeah. so like blended into this weirdo recording. You know, we talk a lot about like old school, early eighties recordings and how like it's a part of the band. And for the chisel, I think that all the recordings do this, but sometimes like it does it like, to be completely honest, I don't think it always works because I think they could sound even better with like a brighter recording. Like why does shock troops stand out so much? 
right? Like that recording rules. You can hear everything and it is so tuneful and like the chisel, they can do the raging songs and they also do like the really nice tuneful songs. Like sometimes I want to hear everything, yeah. but <laughs> on this song, it like just works so perfect and it's just magical. Like it could be on any like early eighties, like oi record. Like, is that good? It's like right there, dude. Well, that's so, like, why when, the when you hear like, it's just like it. <laughs> what's that? I said that's why the recording sounds just like it's off of the strength strength through oil or whatever, you know. Yeah, right on. Pops, what's your take? I so I'm going to preface this by saying I love this. It was a fucking great ride. I think to work backwards, you know, if you're going to cover a really iconic song, you have to make it yours. And you know, they brought their personality to Harry May. It's awesome. Um, my. I like the first song the best um, title I don't have in front of me. It gave me vibes of like love song by the damned and, you know, second song rad ripper two apparently is his fan fiction. They're saying they use the, the piano that the foreskins used on plastic gangsters. Interesting. But the one thing I will say is that I think this band gets a little bit of a pass on their lyrics. I think if they were a straight edge band, you know, writing like kind of like semi generically, we'd be a little more critical in this age, but, you know, being like, you know, lyrics about like, you know, I'm fucking drunk. Here's a fucking cunt. Like it's not doing it for me. And then kind of this, like, I don't want to come down too hard, but the hating the media, the kind of like both so- both sides are wrong trope is a little lazy for me. So I've, I felt like – and it's kind of tough too, right? Because you're in a genre where you kind of have to just do nursery rhymes, and I get that. But I thought the lyrics were the weak point on this. But I, I love it. I'm not taking anything away from it. But I do have to offer that critique because it, it, it was one of those things where I liked it so much. I'm going to read along, right? And I was just kind of like, eh. All right, it's that's that's not tracking for me. Well, I so think, I'll be, I'll be the fucking I'll be the the cloud over this one. I'm fine I with think, it. I think that's fair. I but I I do want to say like I think that for straight edge hardcore bands like the genericness has just been beaten out of us, right? Like we lived through the late '90s where it was like, oh my god, we're just getting beat down on all sides by generic straight edge hardcore, and so like we have no tolerance for it anymore. In fact, like. Since then, I feel like every generation only tolerates like one band like that, whether it's like the first step or like later as mindset or now, like, I don't know who the band would be, but like, mm-hmm. it's like, there's one tentpole band, like they can do that genre. Like, we're not going to let 50 bands do this shit again. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah I guess I'm, I'm offering it. Like when I, when I offer, when I offer a critique, it's, I'm coming from the, the place of like looking at it in, in the canon of everything and saying, Oh, what would I offer if you're asking my opinion that would make this better? If this thing had like lyrics that blew my mind with this music, it'd probably be like my favorite thing ever. And so to me, it was just kind of a little like, eh, it's cool. Well, can you I, know? Re- can I, 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 that, but Dan, let me, let me go right before you. So I think that the, some of the genericness of the lyrics, so just like really plays into like when you hear a song like this, what I see, like if they don't have that line, like, they'll pit you against your fellow brother. And then it goes into like the chorus, like it's such like a nice, like wrap your arm around your buddy moment, you know, like the genericness makes it better almost. Dan, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But what if you want to be wrapped around your sister, man? Come on, let's fucking, let's go. It's 2021. Yeah, it, I don't know. It, that's a generic <laughs> term. Right? Like It's like, dude. No, I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like, dude, I'm kidding. you know, I don't know. Dan, what do you think? It's a lot easier to look at this with, uh, so real quick, we got Echo somewhere. Dan, uh, Dan, go ahead. Well, what this lyrically is in, let me just place it in the world that it is. This is a song being written in post Brexit Britain. That Brexit was completely architecturalized by the fucking red top newspapers and the Daily Mail. And they spouted all kinds of hatred and all kinds of false facts and fake news to make people divide. And so corporations could fucking run riot 
and not be regulated and get out of Europe and not have the European regulations and all false facts. And this song is speaking on that. That's what it's about. It's about, listen, like you're believing all this stuff that is against your own interests. And yeah, it is in basic sentences, but that's what Oi does because it's, it's getting a point across in a blunt fashion and a tuneful fashion. And so I, 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 I think the lyrics are fantastic for what it's saying. And yeah, there are some simple sentences, but deep down what it's saying is do not trust what you think it is. And we are all a society and you can't let them make us not be one. I mean, it's happening over here. It's happening in England. It's happening in Germany. It's happening everywhere. Um, there is a massive amount of money going into dividing and conquering and making everyone fight amongst themselves. Look at probably how much stuff is being funded in the words of anti-vax, et cetera, and all of that just to create arguments anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Just to dig into that real quick, like understanding the context totally. But the thing to me is like, when you write these songs, like when you write a song called guilty of being white, you leave it open-ended for the wrong interpretation. And when you're doing it on such a simple level, you know, a lot of people, especially if they don't get the context of Brexit are going, that's right. Fuck the media. And that works for the Trump guy too. You know what I mean? So it's like, or the fucking Boris guy, like a little more nuance, a little more context. And I'm being hypercritical. But for me, it's like, if you're going to do it, right, you're going to do it, put your flag in the ground and, and say it, you know, call it out a little more universally. But again, I'm looking at it through hypercritical eyes to me. Yeah, but I think they do that, Anthony. I think yeah, it's the same fucking dickheads trying to influence me. Don't know why, but it seems to me that there's so much hatred in this country, you know, and then later on, like... Um, This country's been brought to its knees, but not by the people in the paper you read. Blue or red, they don't care about you. Their money, their mansions, and their suits. That's what, you know, that's what they care about. And, And then the line that's the best is, this country ain't ever been free. Like, everyone's clamoring on for this freedom. As people, like, caught in this rat race, none of us are really free. You know, they try, they dangle that carrot, like we're all, you know, attempting to be free, but we're locked in a fucking capitalistic society and you either choose to make your life less painful and get on board or you really are, you know, going against the system and your life's going to be very uncomfortable, but you're doing, you know, God's work. You know what? Dan, unofficial publicist for the band, I'm announcing an about face after that, and I am less critical now, and I'm being totally serious. <laughs> this stuff just makes you want to slam, man. I love it. Ben, what's yeah. your think? It also has a piano in it, which plays the same notes as the guitar, which is kind of cool, like doubled it, doubled up. You don't hear piano in oi music very often. Well, and, Pop's talking about that. Were you peeing? Yeah, I was. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I took a little bathroom break. I hope you didn't mind. Well, Classic good. Gangsters is the song Pops reference that they said that wherever they recorded this, they used the same piano as that. And that is the most, I would say that is the premier piano based Oi song up to this point. <laughs> yep. Up to this point. This song rips. It the That added instrumentation is awesome. Yeah. And, I don't like most Oi music and I love this song. So that, I guess that says a lot, right? It's like, if I only like the top 1% of a genre and this, and I like this, it stands to reason that this made, you know, the cut, this is in, this is in that, that top 1%. Um, but I'm looking at, I, I did Google the lyrics as you were arguing with each other and they are <laughs> awful vague, man. I'm sorry to bring us back into this argument. <laughs> <laughs> when he says no. red or blue okay in the u.s red means republican blue means democrat in in the uk what does red and blue mean 
Blue is conservatives, red is labor. Okay, so it's the reverse, and they're saying it doesn't matter. And I agree, it doesn't matter um, that the they just, uh, you know politicians use you to get their point across. There's yeah. lots of people go into politics with the best intentions, but the political machine irons that out of them. Look, AOC just voted to abstain on on uh, that vote. Yeah. So it's just like it, it, the machine ends up corrupting you. You know, the thing that I love also that, you know, Pops touched on it is Harry May. They do the business song, Harry May. I love, you know, just to almost because, you know, they're not going to do it better than the business. But he does go, this one's for you, Mickey, <laughs> which is cool. You know, like giving a shout out to Mickey Fitz, R.I.P. Well, who's yeah. Harry May and who's Mickey Fitz? Because I'm from Merca. I don't know about all this stuff. <laughs> Come on, dude. Mickey no, I'm Fitz serious. I, I don't. I don't know what those things are. I don't. I honestly, I don't know Thanks. who those people are. Mickey well, Fitz, the singer of the business. Dan, who's Harry May? What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Read the lyrics, man. Come on. All right, I got to pull up these lyrics. But uh, but here here's what I have to say. Never was a fan of the business. I am a fan of the chisel. I kind of wish they had just done one more original instead of the business cover. And the other song, um, if you had someone with a California accent singing over it, that song Enough Said, it totally could have been like some 81 Frontier record shit. Defo. And it's got yeah. the what woes would that, what and would that be? What would that be? What kind of genre would that be? We're just going to torture me for those you know, 10 minutes of the pod. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. I, I do want to say, like, I, I don't believe in the both sides-ism stuff. Like, you know, that is lazy. And I'm not talking about this song. Just I'm talking in general. Although I do believe that, like, most people have more in common than we do apart. And we're brainwashed by whatever. Whether it's religion, whether it is, like, the media or whatever. That is true, but I, I agree with what Pops is saying of, of just saying, fuck the media. Sometimes it's lazy because I see it like I, I kind of do my research of, of all sides of things. And, you know, when people fall into the trope of fuck the media, they just lie to you like they're getting their news from even more sus places, you know. So just like anything, like if you have to write a book report when you're in high school, you have to use multiple sources and we need to do that to you know, to form our ideas, like don't, don't rock that single source bullshit or, you know, shared Facebook posts to get your information. Yeah. But I don't think they're referencing that it's all sides of, I think they're saying like the red tops and the daily mail are the ones that orchestrated this whole thing. No, I said that I'm not, I'm not referring to the song. I'm talking. No, in I general. I, I'm just saying to get back to the song, I'm saying this is, this is a post Brexit song speaking about Brexit without without it being name checked in the song. I think that's fair. Anyway, this seven inch rules. Everyone check it out. It's on Spotify. There is a playlist for every episode, so you can go to one hundred eighty five miles south dot com. Click that playlist link. You can check all the songs we talked about for the Boston Starter Kit, as well as a couple headcount songs and a couple chisel songs. So anytime we talk about stuff on this podcast, there is a playlist and uh, check that out and everyone will talk to you soon.